Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase it immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to any, of, any one of these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 171. Please turn to it. <coughs> page 171. The very first problem they have there, number 133. Let's take a look at it. 133. Before we actually go through the problem, number 133, I just want to make a note of it before I forget it. I would like you to compare this problem with number 124 on page number 169. And if you have not watched, if you have not watched the video containing the solution to this particular problem, number 124 on page 169. Pause this video, watch that video first, and then you will see that you will get more out of this one, number 133. Here's what we're told. We're told that we have eight teams, and they're going to play each other, each place, each of the other, each of the others, only once. So each team is going to play each of the other team and only once. And the question is very straightforward. The question is, what's the total number of games that they're going to play? What's the total number of games that they're going to play? This problem is very similar to question number, problem number 124 because even though it looks like a very different problem and in a phrase in a very different way, here's what's going on. We have eight teams, we are told. We have eight teams. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 teams. Okay, watch what happens. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. We have 8 teams. And the question is, question is, how many games are they going to play? Well, let's find out, shall we? If we just, if we were to just count the boxes here, it's eight times eight. Obviously, there are sixty-four boxes, as you can see. There are sixty-four entries. The question is, do we count this box? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Do we count that box? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Obviously, Team A is not going to play itself. Similarly. This box here, team B is not going to play itself. That doesn't count. And similarly, C does not play itself. None of the diagonals count. The diagonals do not count. The diagonals do not count. So the very first thing you notice is that it is not 8 times 8. Let's call this 8 n number of teams. A n equals 8. So it is not n squared. It is not n squared, but it is n squared minus n. It's 8 times 8 minus 8. Because all of these eight entries in the diagonals that we see do not count. Team A is not going to play itself, obviously. Team B is not going to team play team B. There is no such thing. And so on and so forth. Each of the diagonals are going to remain empty. Second thing we need to understand is that once we have figured out this quantity, n squared minus n, once we have figured out that quantity, second thing that we need to understand is that the top half that you see there, top half that we see there, is the mirror image of what you see in the bottom half, is the mirror image. In other words, once Team A has played Team B. Well, that's the same match as the well, once the Team A has played Team B right here. This this guy right here. But this is going to be the same entry as this guy. The score here and here is not going to be any different. A match between a Team A and a Team B is the exact same match as the match between Team B and Team A. We can't count it twice. If we did that, we'll be double counting it. Every single entry here is counted twice. Every single entry. For example. Uh, a match between H and C, 
H and C right here, right here, H and C would be C and H. Here is H and here is C. These two entries that you see there, this star and this star that you see there, they would have the same exact score. They are mirror image of each other. The match between team H and team C is the same match as the match between team H and team C and team H. You get the idea. Everything is double counted. To take care of the double counting, once we have this quantity n squared minus n, we need to take half of it. And that's how many, that's how many games are going to be played. That's how many matches are going to be played among eight teams. So the final answer is 8 squared minus 8 divided by 8, uh, divided by 2. 8 squared over 8, uh, 8 squared minus 8 over 2, 64 minus 8, 64 minus 10 would have been 54, so it's 56, 56 over 2. How many 2's in a 5? 5 has 2 2's. The remaining one goes, that joins the 6, becomes 16, and 16 has 8 2's. So it turns out, 28 matches are going to be played among these 8 games. Do you understand? Very good. Now at this point, for a brief second, pause the video, go back to this problem, number 124, page 169, and take a very quick look at it, because we're going to do something with it in a second. Now, here's what we're going to do. Instead of eight teams, instead of eight teams, let's pretend that instead of eight teams, we have eight cities. We have eight cities, not eight teams. And we're going to show, we're going to show the mileage between pairs of cities. How many entries? How many entries? What's the minimum number of entries that is required on this mileage chart? Well, it's the exact same concept. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. To start out with, there will be no entry in the diagonal. We're not going to show mileage from town A to town A. That will be damn silly. There will be entries of zero over there in the entire diagonal. So there are no entries in the diagonals. Similarly, once we have indicated the miles a mileage between town A from, from town A to town B, but that mileage from town A to town B is the same mileage as from town B to town A. This mile and this mile is going to be the same. There is no need to show it twice. So the mileage chart typically shows either the bottom half or the top half. It does not show the entire thing because it's redundant. It's the same exact thing as I said already, as we said already, is a mirror image. The top half is the mirror image of the bottom half. They are symmetrical. And the answer is how many entries are we going to see in the chart? The mileage, if you want to show the mileage among eight cities, the answer is 28 entries. Now what's going on in number 124 is that they, they make it more intimidating. Instead of giving you eight cities, they have given you 30 cities. But nothing changes. Nothing changes. The concept does not change. The concept, concept is still the same. We have n, my, n squared, which is 30 times 30. Then we subtract 30 from it because 30 entries are going to appear in the diagonal. And then we take a half of that quantity. Half, either the top half or bottom half, doesn't matter. So in number, so, so now we are not doing 133, we are doing number, number 124. So in 124, if you had a mileage chart with 30 cities, how many entries are we going to have? We are not going to have 900 entries, we are going to have 930 squared minus 30, which is 900 minus 30, which is 870 over 2. Half of 800 is 4, 435. We're going to have 435 entries in this mileage chart if we were to show the mile, miles, mileage between two cities, uh, if we have a chart showing 30 different cities. Let's do the next problem, shall we? Number 134. Just give me one brief second. Number 134. In number 134, we are told that A theta B, this is the Greek sim, uh, this is the Greek letter, Greek letter theta. A theta B, we are told, represents this operation, A minus B over A plus B. In other words, whenever we see a quantity on the right hand side of the theta and a quantity on the left hand side of the theta, what we are told to do is, 
is to take their difference and divide by their sum. That's all it is. The question is, how much is a theta c? No, the question is, if a theta c is equal to zero, well, first of all, let's find out what a theta t would equal to. We are told that uh, just give me one second. I'm reading here. One number c such that if a does not equal negative c and a theta c, so we are told that a theta t equals zero. Well, how much is a? No, oh, just don't confuse this symbol with the theta there. That's just the way I write my zero. This this symbol right here is also a Greek symbol, phi. And some people have a habit of writing zero with the Greek letter phi, because otherwise it gets confused with the letter a letter o. So to distinguish letter o with the letter zero in the computer language, we use this symbol here, which is phi. Anyway. So see right here, this is this, this getting confused. Anyway, a theta c is zero. A theta c would be simply a minus c instead of b. We replace it with c. A minus c instead of b. We have c plus, uh, over a plus c, and we are told that this quantity equals zero. Well, if that quantity equals zero, then obviously it's not the bottom that's going to be zero. That's why they go out of their way. They go out of their way to tell us that a does not equal negative c. Why do the why do the bottom tell us that? A does not equal negative c because a, if a did equal negative c, if a did equal negative c, the negative c and the positive c would be zero, and this quantity will be undefined. It will no longer be zero. Anything divided by zero is undefined. It's infinity. That's why they make a fuss here by telling you that a does not equal negative c. So if a over b, if some quantity divided by some other quantity equals zero, then the top has to be zero. A minus this implies that a minus c must be zero, and therefore a must equal c. The question was, if a theta c equals zero, then what must be true? The answer is, well, if a theta c is zero, then it must be true that a equals c. The answer is e. The answer is e. Let's move on to 135. Next problem, number 135. In number 135, we are told that the price of lunch for 15 people equals $207. We are told that the price of lunch for 15 people was $207. We are also told that that amount includes, which includes, 15% gratuity, 15% tip. Question is, what's the average price, what's the average price, or price per person, average price, without the tip. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. First, uh, I'm, I'm debating here if I want to digress here for a second or not. Let's learn this word and while we are at it, let's learn this word. Perquisite. Learn it. I won't tell you what it is right now. I won't tell you right now. We, uh, let's create a little suspense and I would like you to learn this word. Perquisite along with the word gratuity which of course we already know. Lost it. It looks like we never learned the word perquisite in our vocabulary lessons. And I'm going to make a note to myself here. The word perquisite, I'm looking at here. Maybe we did learn it. Just give me one second here. I find it very hard to believe that we, I have not covered the word perquisite. I'm looking at all the P words here. Just give me one brief second and I'll find it. Oh, there you go, day number 47. Just type in, just type in GMAT vocabulary words if you're interested in improving your vocabulary. It doesn't hurt to have good vocabulary in the exam or for that matter in life in general. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words, day 47, and watch that video, okay? And you will learn about perquisite. Don't worry about the fact that sometimes I tend to misspell words. I am spelling is not my forte. So what's the average price per person without the tip? Let's find out, shall we? Enough of the talk. We're going with a very leisurely pace. Let's, let's just do it here. So we are told that 207 represents, represents 
amount that includes 15% tip. Well, if it represents an amount that includes a 15% tip, then 217% must represent 115% of the total. Whatever the total amount was, for the, whatever the total amount was for the lunch, they added another 15% on top of that. So this this amount, 207, must represent 115% of the total amount, which are which is which is the amount that was without the tip. Let's translate this thing into equation, shall we? 207 represents simply means equals 115%. 115% percent means over 100. That's what, word, uh, that's what the word percent means. Percent literally means per 100. Off means times. And total is our total. Let's solve for this total. And this will be the amount without the tip. Let's solve for it, shall we? And if we manipulate it, we'll find that t equals 207 times 100. 207 times 100 over 115. How do we know if a number is divisible by 3? Well, we have learned this thing many, many times. A number is divisible by 3 if the sum of the digits happens to be something that is divisible by 3. Here we have 1 plus 1 which is 2, 2 plus 5 is 7. That of course is not divisible by 3. Oh, well, too bad. Let's divide top and bottom by 5. 100 has 25 and this one here, 11 has 2 5s. 11 has 2 5s, the remaining one goes and joins the 5 becomes 15 and 15 has 3 5s. Well, when, when, when a situation gets this weird, it does not actually hurt to take a second and ask yourself, does this happen to be some nice multiple of 23? Let's find out. Let's ask ourselves that question. Does it happen to be some nice multiple of 23? And what we should realize here, what we should realize here, if you did not, then it would have been nice if you did realize it, is that we know 230, we know 230, of course, is 10 times 23. Are you able to see that 207 is exactly 23 less than 223? The 207 is exactly 23 less than 230. Are you able to see that? One more time. Are you able to see that 207 is exactly 23 less than 230? In other words, if you should subtract 23 from here, you will get 207. This represents, this represents 10 times 23. And since we took away 123, this must be 9 times 23. What we need to understand, what we need to understand here is that these numbers that appear in the exam, they do not fall from the sky. Nothing in this exam happens by fluke. Nothing that goes on in this exam happens by chance. Every tiny little detail is there by design. It is there by design. A lot of thought goes into it, a lot of thinking, a lot of work goes into it, into making these questions. They do not just appear out of nowhere. These are not made impromptu. So we just found out that 207 is 9 times 23. 9 times 23, right there. So we have 9 times 20, which is 180. It turns out that the total cost is 9 times 20, which is 180. And that amount was the amount for 15 people. The question was, what's the average amount without the tip per person? So we have to divide this 180 by 15 to find out the amount per person. Let's do that. So the average price, average price without the tip, well, we know that without the tip, the price is 180. If you divide that by 15 people, because there are 15 people in the party there, how many 15 in it? And 18? 18 has 115. 18 has 115. The remaining 3 goes and joins the 0, becomes 30. And how many 15 in 30? 30 has 2 15s. Voila. Turns out that the cost per person was exactly $12. Cost per person turns out to be exactly $12. That was it. Give me, give me a little second, a little break here and we'll do the next one. Number 136. Number 136. We have, we have a town X which has 64% of people who are employed. We are told that 46%, 48% rather, of population is employed male. The question is, here's the question, what percent is employed people? Pay attention to what percent of the people are employed. What percent of the people 
what percent of employed people what percent of employed people now my question is not written properly what percent of the employed people in the town X are female oh what percent of employed people see that's, that doesn't make any sense what percent of employed people are females let's do it together shall we we need the room so we can erase everything that was day number 47 I believe so one more time perhaps I shouldn't have written it in such a lousy way so we have a town X where 64 percent of people we are told we are employed and we are told that 48 percent of the population is employed male 48 percent of the population is employed male the question is what percentage of employed people what percentage of the employed people are female employed people are female let's find out shall we what percentage of employed people The emphasis here is employed people. What percentage of employed people? Not what percentage of the population. What percentage of the employed people? They have to be employed. Here's the solution. Let's pretend that town X has 100 people. Why 100? Because we are dealing with percentage problem. And in the percentage problem, it's very easy to plug in. 100 is very, 100 is very, easy, to, very, a very easy number to work with. You could plug in 50 or you could plug in 60, but that will just create more work. If you're dealing with percentage problem, always use multiples of 100. So, we are told that 64 of the people are employed, and the remaining, whatever it is, is unemployed. We're not interested in that part. 64% of the people are employed. We are told, we are further told, that 48% of the population, we are further told that 48% of the population is employed male. 48% of the population is employed male. So if you're going to pretend that the town has 100 people, if you're going to pretend the town has 100 people, which, which is what we are doing here, we're pretending the town has 100 people, we plugged in 100. 48% of the population, 48% of the population is employed male. Well, 48% of the population is 48, because the population is 100. 48% of 100 is just 48, which means 48 of these people out of 100, 40 of them are, 48 of them are employed male. 40 of the, 48 of them are employed male. We know 64 of them are employed. They tell us right there, 64% is employed. Out of which, 48 are employed male. Total number of employed people is 64, out of which we just found out that 48 of them are employed male. We subtract the two. 14 minus 8 would be 6. 5 minus 1 would be 16. 16 must be employed female. 16 must be employed female. We're not done yet. Question was not how many people, how many, the question was not how many of these people in the town are employed female. The question was, the question was, what percentage of the employed people, this is where you have to pay attention, what percentage of the employed people are female? Well, we just found out that there are 16 female in this town who are employed. Out of 100 people in the town, there are 16 people, 16 female, rather, there are 16 female that are employed. What does the 16 represent as a percentage of the total number of people that are employed? What percentage of the employed people? Employed people. How many employed people do we have? We have 64 employed people. So here we go. The percentage that we're looking for is this. The, the percentage that we're looking for is employed female, employed females over total employed. How many, how many females are employed in the town? 16 of them. How many total people in the town are employed? 64 of them. 16 out of 64, that is one quarter, that equals one quarter, hence, hence one out of every four person who has a job in this town, one out of every four people who is employed turns out to be a female. 25 percent of all the employed people in this town are female. That's what they were looking for. What percent of the employed people are female? The answer is a quarter of all the employed people in the town are female. Three quarters of the employed people must be male. Well, that must be male. It is. We just found it's 48. 48 out of 64. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.